The following talk was given at the Insight Meditation Center in Redwood City, California. Please visit our website at audiodharma.org. Good morning. So, um, a couple of weeks ago I started to talk about delusion and kind of did an overview on recognizing delusion as it functions in our minds. And there's a lot of different ways that delusion works. And I named three particular ways. Uh, one being just the, the kind of the disconnect that we have with experience at times when we're not mindful, when we're kind of lost in our thoughts. This is a form of delusion when we're not aware consciously aware of what's happening in the present moment. Then the, the second form I talked about was like views that we have, views of, um, views created by um, our personal lives and our cultural lives, our family lives, that, that we all, um, you know, we come into this world with a certain kind of human body and mind, and then it's shaped by our, our culture and our uh, conditioning and our upbringing. And this is the terrain I'd really like to explore today, this area of views that happen uh, as we are um, conditioned in this life, um, enculturated in our families and our schools and our uh, and, and just one-to-one -one sometimes with various individual relationships. The third kind of um, delusion is what I would, I would call human delusion. It's, it's not so much learned in this life, but it's the kind of the delusions that we tend to come in to being a human being with. The, the kind of uh, confusion or um, tendency to misperceive what's impermanent to be permanent. We tend to misperceive what is unreliable as a place for lasting happiness, to be reliable as a place for lasting happiness. And we tend to in, uh, believe that things that are uncontrollable should be controllable. Or sometimes we can, uh, it's framed in the Buddhist teaching that things that are not me, not mine, not who I am, are uh, taken to be me, mine, who I am. So today I'd like to explore this middle topic of views, views that are created by our conditioning. So our views, you know, our views are um, so many different ways that views come in, as I mentioned, you know, just interacting with individuals, um, as we're children, often that's a lot of places where views are formed as we, we interact uh, with, with parents, with uh, other adults, with other children. Views are formed. Some of them are coming in as information or messages from, from our world. Uh, some of them are you know, coming in from uh, how people behave with us in... Um, behavioral ways and so like you know just in our culture there are patterns and habits of how we interact with people who are close to us how we interact with people we don't know and th a lot of that is learned kind of through uh, observation rather than through being told this is what you do when you meet somebody you don't know I mean I never got that conversation with my parents I'm pretty sure that they didn't sit down with me and say you know they did tell me don't take candy from strangers but you know, they, they didn't say, um, this is how long you might keep eye contact with a stranger. This is how close you stand to a stranger. Uh, you know, so they didn't, they didn't talk about things like that, but that was absorbed. You know, so these are cultural, cultural things that can be absorbed. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, views that we, uh, that we absorb um, based on our interaction with people about who we are, what we're capable of, what others are capable of. We absorb views of what's right and what's wrong. We uh, absorb views of the world, of what the, what, the, what the world is, what the world is about.
So in these, well, I'm going to break these, um, these kinds of views down a little bit because I think each of us, it's useful, it's useful for each of us to become aware of our views and to, to have kind of different categories to become aware of might support um, uh, the recognition of views. And, you know, mindfulness is a huge support in this. I would say in terms of delusion, in terms of unmasking delusion, the biggest piece is becoming aware of what's going on. Mostly in our, um, kind of the way we navigate our world, we are not so aware of views. They are below the level of our conscious awareness and we don't know, for instance, that we're carrying these views of other people. Or we don't know that, that we're carrying a view of um, you know, how you interact when you meet somebody you don't know. Until we maybe meet somebody from a different cultural background and there's a different response. And then sometimes instead of recognizing, oh, that's a view, we think that person is weird. So, and they may be thinking the same about us because they've got different, different views about how these things work. So beginning to recognize views as views instead of views as truth, views as the way things are, that's a big part of how, uh, how we um, begin to uncover views. And actually views are a huge source of suffering in our world. And this is a, this is a big thing, this is a big part of what I'd like to talk about today. Um, how views connect to suffering, not only for ourselves, but for others, for the planet, for our societies. It's, it's enormous, the suffering that comes from views. Um, and then in a couple of weeks, what I'm going to talk about is what uh, the Buddhist tradition calls wise view. So... It's not that views are inherently problematic, but recognizing, recognizing that we're holding a view and being able to look at it and recognize, is this a useful view to be holding? Or is this a, uh, a, a view that's contributing to suffering? So that's essentially the direction I'd like to explore over the next few times I'm here. I'm not here next week, but... Uh, this week and then two weeks from now, exploring these two sides of views. So today I'd like to kind of focus on how views can be uh, participating in the creation of our suffering. So different kinds of views, personal views. These are views that are created, that are very, they're very much associated with us. You know, it's like, this is who I am. This is, uh, this is what I do. This is how I think. This is how I feel. Um, and a lot of that does come from how we have been personally conditioned through our um, you know, interactions with people. And then views of um, you know, personal or societal views. I'd say the, per I mean, I'm sorry, societal views rather than personal views. So personal views also can be in the relationship or looking at individual relationships. This is how I am as... Um, a, a sibling. This is how I am as a parent. This is how I am as a, as a partner. This is uh, how I am as uh, a child, uh, as, a, as a, an offspring. So that, uh, you know, so we, we have these roles and relationships that are conditioned sometimes within our family, but often there are some personal pieces in there. And then um, the societal views there's a lot of cultural views that are more widely shared. You know, the personal views are, are maybe a little bit easier to see at times because we bump up against people that have different personal views than we do. Um, when we're in a, in a culture where there's not a lot of interaction with other people in other, different, other cultural um, um, surroundings, other cultural milieus, then... Um, then we don't see our cultural views so much as views. So they're a little more deeply buried. Our cultural views are more deeply buried. They're harder for us to see. And um, you know, a couple of views that uh, 
um, are kind of pervasive in our um, well, in in the the dominant culture here in the United States. One something like, um, "I have something, therefore I deserve it," um, or perhaps. I don't have something, therefore I don't deserve it. Other variations on those themes. Um, the, 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 the notion of a view around deserving, you know, I guess... Um, the the understanding in our in our um, you know, like I guess what what that I have something therefore I deserve it often springs from the notion that there's been some agency in this being that has done something that has received something you know that has gotten something and we uh, attribute the having of that thing to our personal um, goodness or maybe badness, depending on what the thing is. We have this thing depending, this is our belief, that we have this thing depending on our own agency. And don't necessarily recognize the vast conditions in the world that also participated in our getting that thing. And so this is a piece of, um, you know, something, uh, 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 an area in um, our culture that's a big pl- place of, of, um, Blindness is white privilege. You know, the, the understanding or the thinking that I have something, therefore I deserve it. And in, the, in, in um, many white people, not recognizing the, the kind of um, support in our culture for someone with white skin. And... and you know, taking more of the agency as being the cause of, of the, the having it rather than conditions and cultural views. So, so the, these kinds, of, so this is a one very real way in which views really create suffering. Then there are um, maybe views we have about the world, how the world works, or society. I mean, not society, but uh, you know, the ultimate nature of being in the world. Um, these, these kind of views, uh, they, they do tend to come around when we meditate. You know, this is a, this is, you know, so we have, we, we have views that, again, these are views that can create huge amounts of suffering. Views in God, views in not believing in God, and holding to those views as being truth and, uh, you know, fighting over them. Views in, uh, you know, the world being flat. This is one maybe that's a little more uh, easy to kind of see in retrospect, perhaps, you know. There were, there were wars fought over um, this notion. You know, and people... You know, believing that the world is round being heretical. Or the, the nature of the universe being that the earth is the center of the universe. This was, people were burned at the stake for saying, no, the earth is not the center of the universe. The sun is the center of the universe. And now we know, actually, there's not really a center of the universe. <laughs> and so these, these views that we hold... I think this is a big piece of the suffering that comes is when we hold to them and say, this is what's true, nothing else is true. So we make it about right and wrong rather than recognizing it's a view. So what's the problem with this? I pointed to some of them. I mean, just the suffering that can come from views. There's some deeper kinds of suffering that can come from views that uh, is demonstrated by this story, a story that I heard on um, a podcast recently. Um, A couple of you heard this story a few days ago in the retreat that I just taught. Um, There's a, this podcast is called Invisibilia, and it's, um, it's a, 
its stated purpose is to show how invisible things affect our, wor- our world physically. I think that's the kind of the, 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 the manifest, or the, what do they call it, the purpose of the, the podcast. I begin to explore the ways invisible things become physical and manifest. And um, the, this particular exploration was about how thoughts... Can, be, can have a physical impact on the world. So this was a study that was done, and it was, I think it was probably done in a psychology department um, on psychology students. And the psychology students were trained, were, were going into the lab where, you know, one thing psychology students tend to do is learn how to train rats to run through mazes, or mice in this case, mice to run through mazes. And so... Um, they were told that they were going to learn how to run these mice through mazes. And they went into the lab and they found the mice in the cages. And just kind of incidentally, not incidentally, but you know, part of what was happening in the, in the room was that some of the cages were labeled by you know, something like, these are intelligent mice. And these are not so intelligent mice. So the, the, the mice were labeled according to their supposed intelligence. And then the students were trained or were learning to run these uh, mice through the mazes. Well, the actual experiment was that the mice were randomly, you know, they were, they were, they were not intelligent mice and non-intelligent mice. They were all the same kind of mice. There had been no testing done on whether they were intelligent or not intelligent. They were just all basically the same. So, um, and so this is a, the, the, the students are walking into the room, they see these labels, and basically there's a belief that gets formed about these, these mice. These are the smart mice. These are the stupid mice. And so they train to run these um, mice through the mazes. And, and what do you think happened with respect to how quickly they learned how to run the mazes? With respect to... Uh, They did. It was not even close. It was not even close. And so the belief, the belief that these are smart mice had an impact. They did take videos and, you know, it's, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think it's like the idea like being transmitted, woo you're like a stupid mouse, you don't do this. It's not... It's not that. They, they, um, they believe, that there wasn't really, they didn't uncover exactly how this happened, but they believe it had to do with how they handled the mice. Just the physical contact, taking more care with the, with the smart mice, being a little more dismissive and less caring in the physical contact with the mice they thought were stupid. This, this like blew me away, you know, just how, you know, th- so we, 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 we have beliefs about people, you know, we have beliefs about children and what they're capable of and, you know, a, a, a parent, a parent with, you know, views about what a, a, a girl can do and a boy can do. A parent with views about not only that, but what girls are supposed to be like and what boys are supposed to be like. These things shape us. And this, and again, and you can kind of see the suffering that can come from this kind of uh, way that views being held and not recognized. That um, you know, when we believe something, it has real impact on the world and can have a great deal of painful impact on the world. And so our views box ourselves in. We can have views about ourselves, of what we're capable of, what we can do, what we can't do, that will limit us. We can have views about others that not only box them in, but shape them. Views about ourselves will shape ourselves. Views about others will shape others. 
And so opening to the possibility that we are not necessarily what we think we are. When, we, when we're not aware of what we think we are, we become what we think we are. It becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prop- prophecy. And, and that's really what, the, what the, the, the labeling of the, the cages of the mice did. It became a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the Buddha talked about views as being a great source of conflict in the world. One um, uh, quote from from one of the teachings of the Buddha says something like, those attached to perception and views roam the world offending people. And so when we're attached, and this is a big piece of it, when we're attached to our views and we don't recognize them as views, this is a big place of where conflict arises. And so, again, beginning to recognize mindfulness that, that something is a view begins to be very helpful. So, you know, here's, here's a good place to look in our practice. If we find ourselves in conflict, Maybe instead of trying to convince somebody that they're wrong and we're, we're right. Something else that I've read recently is to, um, because apparently what happens when each person basically, you know, says, tries to re- keep reinforcing their view, it gets further and further apart. But if the two, uh, if the people are more interested in finding out, oh, I guess we have a different view of this. What's your view? when there's a sense of being encouraged to have the dialogue about view, things really shift and people tend to move closer together. It may not, they may not come to a resolution yet, but, but there's, it doesn't kind of entrench the views as much when you're, you're not just saying, well, oh, I see we have different views. Well, here's my view. You know, that, then that kind of, the other person, well, here's my view. And it it just tends to solidify. So that's a good thing. And I think this is really needed right now in our country. You know, like, okay, let's let's have conversation and, and see if we can each be curious about the other view. What's, what's that? And recognizing, of course, that you know, our own views have conditions coming together. This is another big piece to recognize is that our views are created based on conditioning. Other people's views are created based on conditioning. Neither one of us really decided, I'm, I mean, sometimes we decide we're going to hold particular views, but much, much of our views are not things we've decided to hold, but are things that have, are, are things that have been conditioned in us. And likewise, things that have been conditioned in others. And so if we can recognize that the the vastness of conditioning that comes into play around the creation of views, this also can sometimes help us in recognizing, you know, so these set of conditions created the view that this is how happiness can be found for me. And over here, this person, these conditions created the view that this is how happiness can be found for me. And so we begin to recognize that we're, we're not so different in the, in the wish for the happiness and well-being of myself, for my family, for my friends. Basically, you know, that, that wish for well-being and happiness. We just have really different ideas about what that means. And so maybe sometimes we can also begin to step into the more human nature the more human underpinnings of what these views are built on top of. And that can also help a conversation happen when we recognize, okay, your views have been conditioned. My views have been conditioned. Let's see if we can have this conversation. So I've talked a little bit about views forming based on conditions. I want to talk about some of those conditions, how views get formed. Um, a lot of our views do get formed through, through, uh, through our experience in the world. How, we, how, how things happen to us as we walk through the world. 
And it, when things are repeated, when, we, when something happens in the world many times, it begins to be... I mean, it, and it's part of the way our minds work, I think. When something happens many times, it's like this gets conditioned as, oh, this is the way it works. This is how I need to navigate the world. And so instead of having to figure it out every time, the, the kind of the system gets tuned in that direction. And it, it, it creates the view based on this repeated experience. And so when something is repeated in our lives, views can form around that views form around that. Sometimes even just one exposure to something, you know, and being told something, one exposure to something. The classic uh, teaching story about this in the time of the Buddha was a story about the blind people and the elephant, which I think many of you are are familiar with, but I'll just give the the brief version of it. So in this teaching story, and this is found directly in the Buddhist teachings, which I thought was interesting because it's something I've heard, I heard as a child. I found it interesting to realize it was a 2,600 year old story, probably predates the Buddha is my guess. Um, So uh, blind people are shown an elephant by, by being, having, you know, having their hands contact various parts of the elephant. Some some of the blind people are shown the elephant by touching the leg, some by touching the side of the elephant, some by the tail, some by the trunk, and and then uh, they were brought together and asked to describe an elephant, and some those that were that uh, touched the leg said the, an elephant is like a post. Some touching the side of the elephant said it's like the wall of a storeroom. Others touching the tail said it's like a broom. Others touching the trunk, it's like a rope. And rather than, rather than saying, gee, this is the teaching story, right? So the teaching story is that they basically came to blows, fighting over. No, you're wrong. I know from my own experience, an elephant is like this, an elephant is not like that. Rather than having the curiosity, wow, you know, there's different views here. Let's see if we can figure out what's going on. People cemented into their views and came to blows. So this is, this is the, the teaching story that uh, when we have an experience, this is a very tenacious place for views to be held. Now, it's not wrong to say this part of the elephant is like a post. And, and you know, so, so to, um, uh, to recognize, too, that the people were shown the elephant and said, this is an elephant, right? And so they got the idea, this is an elephant. And this experience is an elephant. They didn't uh, question whether this is the entirety of the elephant. And that's, I think, a big place in which views happen. We experience something in a very limited way. We form a view about that, and, um, and then it, it, be, it becomes hard to let that go. It's, it's said in the Buddhist teaching that, in particular, experiences we have in meditation are some of the hardest most difficult views to let go of because it's 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 a little it's it's like it's such a deep kind of feeling experience we come out of a meditative experience it feels like we've touched something deeper than we've touched before and often some view can be formed around that experience awareness is like this mind is like this, the world is like this, the universe is like this. And the Buddha pointed to the danger particularly around forming meditation, views out of our meditation experience. Again, it's kind of like touching the the leg of the elephant. We may have touched into some aspect of experience, and undoubtedly we have. But that may not be the entirety of experience. There was another story I heard. I read this one. I read this story. Um, 
in reading about um, views, the kind of research that's done on views. There's a lot of research that's being, has been done on views since about the 70s, I think. Um, and in particular, it seems to be of interest right now. People are talking a lot about um, um, confirmation bias, you know, that we tend to look for information. This is another one of the dangers of views, that when we hold a view, our tendency, and it's a natural tendency, it's not a mistake in our system in some way, it's, it's a natural tendency, and yet it's a dangerous tendency. And so it's useful to be aware of this as a tendency, that when we have a view, we tend to search out information that confirms that view and ignore information that does not confirm that view. So this is another one of the dangers of views. And so knowing that this is how our mind works, some of the, some of the um, studies have recommended that what we consciously do is when we hold a view, we look for the other side. We look for information that will disconfirm our view. Most, most people don't tend to, and they, they've done this with like studies on, on cards, you know, like, like um, um, putting out cards that I can't remember. That I, I'll have to write this one down so that I can give you the exact thing. But, you know, you put out cards that, you know, have two different sides and one's got a letter on one side and a number on the other side. And, you know, it's like, do all cards with A's have ones on the other side of them? And um, um, people will often think of turning over a card that has an A and see, does that have a one on the other side of it? And if they see, they turn over the A cards and they say yes, and they say, oh, yes, it's true, all. But then, but then they don't think of turning over a card that has a B on it and see that that one also has a one on the other side of it. They're not looking to disconfirm their view. They're looking to confirm their view. So again, this is a, a, this is a process that, tends, that, that our system as human beings tends towards, this confirmation bias. So that's, that's one interesting piece about views also, that having that information can help us to be, you know, be curious. So looking for information that um, is on the other side, perhaps. And recognizing, of course, especially in the political climate that we're in, you know, that... Um, uh, it can be, you know, we can really, really be looking for things that confirm our views. And um, I, I, I would notice the emotional charge that goes with this. I mean, it's like, often when I read something that agrees with my view, I'm like, yes, this is right. <laughs> it's like, oh, phew, okay, there is some energy there. And when I read something that doesn't, it's like, no, that's wrong. It's like, okay, there's some energy there. And so not, not exploring taking in the information there, but maybe taking, seeing if I can find a time when I'm a little less charged, maybe taking it in smaller doses and noticing that, that confirmation bias that's resulting in that emotional charge. So, so that's an, a piece that we can, we can explore. So there's another study that's done about views that really impacted me quite powerfully that I just read a couple of weeks ago. And that's about how quickly views can form. Um, so this study was uh, again, looking at how quickly views are formed. And so this, this, in this study, they gave one group of people a story. It was like a story about a firefighter who um, followed the letter of the safety rules for firefighters. And this firefighter was very successful, saved a lot of lives, lots of buildings were, were saved. Um, so very successful in his, her, his or her, in their, <laughs> their um, actions. The other firefighter, it, the other people got a story about a firefighter who um, took risks, did not follow the safety guidelines. And that firefighter was uh, successful. Um, I think they were both given like two sides. So in one side, the, the, fi the firefighter was successful when they uh, followed safety regulations and not so successful when they didn't. And in the other side, it was flipped that, you know, 
the, the firefighter that followed the safety regulations was less successful, actually didn't save as many people, more buildings burned, and then, and then uh, the one who uh, took the risks was more successful. So people were given these stories to read. And then um, immediately they were told these were fabricated stories. There is no truth to these stories whatsoever. Sometime later, I don't know how long later, they were asked about their views about whether firefighters are more successful when they are following the safety regulations or not. And their views on that aligned with what they had read. They had one exposure to the information. They were told the information was wrong. And the views were still created. This is, this is, this is the frightening power of delusion to me. This is humbling that as human beings we tend to do this. It's so <laughs> let's become aware. <laughs> let's become aware of our views. Let's start to to uh, question what we believe. So a useful question for us. This is, again, this is uh, something we can do to help us recognize when beliefs are operating. And uh, maybe a good place to begin here is if there's suffering happening in a conversation, just in how we are, in our, in our day, um, in our relationship to news, if we are experiencing distress, there is some kind of view at work. There's almost always some kind of you at work, but if there's distress, there's, there's some kind of distorted view at work at some level. It may, not, it may not necessarily be the personal view that's distorted. Um, it, it, it may be the more human views of this should be reliable, <laughs> this this is permanent. It, so it may be the more human views that are that are that are it, at play in the suffering. But sometimes we can begin to unveil our personal views, our cultural views, by just when they're suffering. It's like, hmm, what is being believed right now? Just when they're suffering, dropping that question in. What is being believed right now? What in what in particular? What am I believing? And I had this actually work for me at one point. I was having a conversation with somebody who had a different political view than I did. And we were trying to have a conversation and I could feel the tension start to build both in myself and in what I understood, what I perceived as being the tone of voice in the other person, uh, you know, getting a little bit tense. And so the feeling in the, in the room was getting a little bit tense. And... Um, I, I decided to ask a question. I said, what, what is it that you're concerned about? So I didn't say, what's your view? But I said, what are you concerned about in this situation? So that was beginning to kind of get into the underlying uh, view. And as soon as I asked that question, whew, the tension released. The other person's voice got a little lower pitched, a little softer. Okay, we could, we could continue the conversation. So sometimes we can ask ourselves, what is the belief? And, and for me, um, you know, my checking in with that other person's view is kind of like I also had to check in. You know, my tendency to want to say, well, this is what I think. It's like, oh, well, that's a view that I think I need to reinforce my, my own view here. Let me, again, be curious about the view of the other. And so asking ourselves, what view is happening here? And being genuinely curious to ask in some way, not in a kind of flagellating way, well, you're holding a view, so, <laughs> you know, that's why we're suffering, is you're holding a view. <laughs> we're both holding views, so exploring that possibility. 
this also there's views not only in interrelationship with with each other but also with ourselves and so for myself for example I grew up and um, struggling with um, uh, having a, a good opinion of myself and um, feeling like I was a failure feeling like I was no good and that got internalized and um, kept being repeated in my mind it wasn't but but I had so self comp I had so compensated for that by being you know trying to prove myself it's like you know I, I was I was like I'm gonna show the world I am okay and I, 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 I was very successful in school and in business and in work and and it wasn't until I was in my 30s and in meditation that I began to see these thoughts you're a failure you're no good so I, I th there were in inklings that I was uh, had self-hatred before I came into meditation but it was mostly that I, I experienced misery but I thought it was because the world was a problem I didn't really see my own my own mind and its belief that I was a failure that I was no good that my own kind of views about self-hatred wasn't until I really began to see that that things began to shift and so sometimes we hold these views I mean uh, what I began to understand about this is that there are these thoughts that have been so conditioned to, to arise you're no good you're a failure you got to try harder but get better do better 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 work hard you know and and so those thoughts were kind of driving everything I did and not seeing that they were kind of rooted in this this fear this fear of failure and so as I began to see the thoughts and see in meditation I could see well there are these thoughts and then there's this kind of different level of belief in the thoughts you know, thoughts and beliefs are actually slightly different beliefs seem to have a a more entrenched kind of uh, capacity it's like they're they're strongly conditioned thoughts will come and go but when thoughts arise what seems to happen is that they like it's like the thought arises and it like picks up a view and carries it along with it and so we can begin to be curious okay you know, so a thought and recognizing thoughts about ourselves about who we are what we're capable of and how much do I believe this there are different times I've been discovered different times when I was um, you know more uh, rested or um, had a lot of you know ease in my day if things had had you know the conditions had been smooth in a particular day then that thought would arise and there'd be less belief with that thought other days the thought would arise and it'd be very strong yeah you are a failure and so recognizing the, the level of belief recognizing just being curious about that beliefs and views I, I use these two words synonymously but sometimes belief can have a more visceral feeling to it than view so if belief works for you what is that what is being believed right now instead of what's the view sometimes that view idea might just feel like it, you're just taking the surface of your mind or something but belief can feel like it's a little more deep so what's being believed we usually often I would say having beliefs exposed does not um, does not pop the bubble of our beliefs I mean, we might think that it would you know like the, like those beliefs those thoughts of you're a failure and, and sometimes saying well I don't even believe that right now but when I saw the thought and I really believed it even seeing that the belief was working I couldn't just simply decide well that's not useful I'm gonna stop believing that but what is helpful is recognizing it as a belief this is this is something I learned a lot in exploring these beliefs that when I recognized these beliefs as beliefs it took it from being just the truth of who I was to being recognized as this is this is just 
something that's being believed right now. And, and as I saw it sometimes believed, sometimes not believed, I could recognize the impermanence of belief and the non, like, non-self nature of belief. So the, the, the seeing that uh, sometimes strong, sometimes weak, I could then start to recognize, okay, this is a belief that's happening right now. I can't decide to stop believing it, but I can know it's a belief. And that begins to kind of wake, break open the mind's like stronghold on that as truth. That's, I think, a lot of what happens for beliefs when they're below the level of our conscious awareness. They are just truth. And as they come into the conscious awareness, we can begin to recognize them as not truth. But as belief, we can begin to recognize them as conditioned. And conditions change. Our, in fact, our meditation practice dramatically changes the conditions of our minds. So, there's more I can say here, but I do want to save some time for comments, questions, and then next time I'll talk a little bit about how views can be helpful. <laughs> They're not, I mean, we might as well harness views to help us <laughs> in our lives because we're going to have them. And so that's what I'd like to talk about the next time. But comments, questions about what I've, I've said or any thoughts that it's brought up for you. I think you commented on it. Um, as I talk to um, people that I love and known for many years and friends, and we had different views and, on what was happening politically, it didn't matter to either one of us what was the truth. Yes. It more and, mattered that, we re, you, that you reinforced the view in some ways. Right. It, yeah. it, you know, yeah. trying to convince my point of view, which perhaps is even self-righteous, um, it didn't matter to the ones who held different views than I, even when I would uh, spew out all of this fact with such compassion. So... Um, you know, I, I just had to stop. So, but it was interesting to finally have that insight that, you know, this is your view, and it, and this is your view. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and, and uh, so know. if you have if you have friends with different political views, you know, I'd encourage seeing if you can engage through that other. You know, let me ask about yours. You know, and then see if they, in turn, respond. There, there can be a, a back and forth, actually. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to, to, to open the dialogue that way. I mean, we have such a habit. It's a strong habit. Maybe it's a cultural habit. I don't know if it's a cultural habit or not, but we do have a strong habit of uh, wanting to s- express, this is what I believe, and reinforcing that, pulling in the facts, the, the things there, and, and uh, rather than being curious about what somebody else believes. And so it, it, it takes some courage to, to, to do that. So that's, that I would encourage something like that. See if you could, see what happens if you approach it from that angle instead of you know, bringing in the facts that support your side. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Just one thing you said that I reacted to a little bit was that whenever distress, whenever we're in distress, views are operating. Um, yes, but I think views are operating all the time. And yes. one of the, the, the well, that's that's why I clarified it. Whenever you're in distress, some kind of an unwholesome view okay. is operating. Well, but even then, I mean, it's sometimes like. Um, and that's not whenever things unpleasant are happening, some kind of un- unwholesome view is operating. Distress and unpleasant are different things. Yeah, right. So, no, I yeah, got that. Okay. <laughs> but um, but it's, it is just like our shock at the results of the election here 
in our sub-communities. It's the it's conformity, it's the conformity of views. We're, we don't have any distress when everyone around us agrees with us. We're content, the world is the way. And, 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 that's, that, and, and, that's, and that in that's a deeper ways, form of delusion. <laughs> that's the yes. most insidious. Yeah, yeah. And, and when I hear like, Norway is the happiest country in the world right now, I wonder, they're also one of the most homogeneous cultures in yeah. the world. Uh-huh. And so, isn't that nice? <laughs> Everybody's, and, and, and so much of the distress is coming from the world needing and being forced, the immigration, the fluid yeah. boundaries everywhere around the world. That's and, and I would say the distress is not a bad thing in terms of waking up. It, right, it's a useful distress yeah. in that sense. Yeah. And if point. we choose to engage with mindfulness, with curiosity around the distress, there's the possibility for some kind of transformation. If we choose to uh, engage in our habitual patterns around distress, it tends to to take us into more separation. Um, you know the kind of um, the kind of suffering of um, um, uh, that you're talking about, like in in cultures that are very non-diverse, very similar, and everybody's happy there. You know the, that form of delusion is more the kind of delusion. Things are controllable. You know things are things are reliable. So this is the more human kind of delusion, uh, and so those are even harder to see. And there are ways to start to see those too. Um, but it's a deeper kind of illusion. And delusion in general is hard to see. Um, but, but so the, the, the kind of first avenue in is when you're suffering, it's, it's, it's not just about things being pleasant or unpleasant, but it's also about a view that's held. So we begin to understand that views are part and parcel of, so a delusion is part and par- parcel of how suffering is constructed. Views are not part and parcel of whether things are pleasant or unpleasant. Um, yeah. so, I, so I get it in a way. It's like when I'm feeling that distress and can look at a view, instead of saying, you're messing up my world because you're not doing it right, you're worshiping the wrong way, or you don't want to help people or you, whatever it is. Um, to take the focus off of that and look at, oh, what views am I holding that I didn't realize that I was holding? How is this violating my sense of um, this perfect controllable world that I thought I lived yeah. in? Yeah, and also to recognize, you know, um, something along the lines of... Um, um, so you don't want to help people for, in, for, instance, for instance that particular view is often related to not I mean so it's, it, there's a belief there I think that is um, helping people looks like this and uh, there are really different views about what helping people looks like <laughs> and so that you know that the, the, so there's like, okay, so maybe we could say more accurately, you don't believe in helping people in the way I think people should be helped. So that's, that's pay, perhaps a more accurate expression of that. Um, and, 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 you know, so, it, yeah, I mean, if, if the belief that you have is that person doesn't believe in helping people, that dehumanizes them. It makes you feel like you don't even want to talk to them or be with them. And so, you know, that, you know, that, again, you know, kind of diving over the barrier. It's like, well, okay, how do you think people should be helped? Something, yeah. So, so just, to, again, the dialogue. And so recognizing that that is a view, again, in conversation, I think it can be helpful to, to notice, okay, these views are here. And then, what? are the other person's views. I mean, they may hold an identical opinion. You don't believe in helping people. <laughs> you know, 
because again, there's just so many different views. But you know, I do think that if we all recognize we we have some shared kind of underlying wishes. Uh, I, I'd say most human beings have some shared wishes for happiness, health, safety, well-being, and really different views about how to get there. So, uh, you know, can we begin to talk about that? I mean, that's like building things from the ground up or something, but, you know, I think we have to go there <laughs> in some way. Yeah. Thank you. And it's time to stop. So, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.